What? Five. Thanks. Okay, so um, the homework has been graded and returned uh, to the boxes of the students who have boxes. Um, for some reason, they're, huh? For some reason, there are always a few people who don't have boxes. And um, the grader said that he'd um, give me those homeworks and I'd pass them out. But he had to give them to me, so I guess I don't know. Where, where are the boxes? Yeah, where are these boxes? Because uh, I think I have a box. Because if I have a box. Okay, yeah. The, the, the boxes are by the copy room. Okay. Outside the copy room are you know, all those boxes. Graduate students have boxes. I, I don't know about undergraduates. Undergraduates. We ought to make more of a, an effort. Uh, it, it may be. Don't these graduates have boxes of like A through D and E through G and so forth? No? Not that I ever knew as a matter of fact. Yeah, I think I've ever heard anybody's Well, that would make sense. We ought to do that. Um, okay. All right, well, any questions before I start? We were talking about her mission matrices last time, and we saw that the eigenvalues of a Hermitian matrix are real. <coughs> we saw that uh, n, n prime is delta n, n prime. This comes about automatically if the eigenvalues a sub n, well, I've normalized them, but the, the point is they're orthogonal if the eigenvalues are different. And then uh, to deal with the case where the eigen some of the eigenvalues are the same, um, I said that instead we introduce a, an operator defined as A plus epsilon B, where B is also her mission and where epsilon is some tiny number, but B is a crooked matrix that breaks all the degeneracy. And so then the eigenvalues of that matrix would all be different. And then as we take the limit epsilon going to zero, the, um, in other words, this would have eigenvalues n uh, sub epsilon. And this would be a sub n of epsilon n of epsilon, but then uh, these will all be different. So n epsilon, n prime epsilon, n epsilon will be delta n prime n. Then if you take the limit, epsilon goes to zero. There's no epsilon over here, so it remain, they remain orthogonal. And in fact, physically, this is the, the right approach. Um, you then pick for a particular problem, you pick some uh, crooked matrix that is likely to actually occur physically. And um, if you're given, for example, with a hydrogen atom, you might have a crooked matrix that results from the application of a magnetic field. Or um, an electric, a constant electric field. And um, these these crooked matrices then is, is that to deal with degeneracy? Well, I mean, that's to deal. With, uh, yes, and it's, to, it's it deals with it in two ways. One way is it's it, it's effectively a mathematical proof that you can that the emission matrices have complete orthonormal sets of eigenvectors with real eigenvalues. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also what one does in actual quantum mechanics problems where you're looking at an atom in a magnetic field, or in an electric field, or in an electric and magnetic field. And in that case, um, in that case, the, the the additional physics is this epsilon d. 
I mean, is that is that to just are you adding that to make sure the the generate states are the right? Yeah, I, I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, well, why not? Because the reason why the reason there, there are, here's the deal. There, you see, I mean, for the math, the proof I guess. You're saying it was for a, a proof, right? It's both for the proof, but it's also um, important yeah. physically and computationally because after all, if you have three or four eigenvectors that are degenerate, the same eigenvalue, then there are infinitely many ways of choosing all the normal com uh, combinations. The Gram-Schmidt procedure gives you one, but if you take any four by four unitary matrix and you hit all four uh, gram schmidt eigenvectors with that unitary matrix, you get another, you get another four orthonormal eigenvectors with the same eigenvalue. So there's an infinite, an infinite variety of orthonormal eigenvectors that you can make out of the, say, four degenerate ones. And the way, the ones that are physically relevant are the ones that occur precisely by this procedure where, um, where you, you pick here an operator that, uh, that is actually present in the problem. So that's the idea. Okay. All right. Now, um, these, uh, so what we've arrived at then is that an n by n Hermitian matrix, in other words, a dag equals a, can, um, will have n orthonormal eigenvectors, and we can then write the identity operator as the outer product of these n orthonormal eigenvectors. Now, if you do that, you have a very simple uh, result, because you can multiply a into the identity operator, and that gives you a on some n n, n equals 1 to the n, but, but this is, in other words, some a n, n, but a on n is a sub n, and so this gives you the sum n equals 1 to big N, n, a sub n, n. So this is a way of writing any Hermitian operator a in terms of its complete orthonormal set of eigenvectors and its eigenvalues. In a, it's, a, it's a particularly nice way of writing it. And um, so in other words, if A is permission, you can write it as sum n equals 1 to n, n, A sub n, n. And that makes it perfectly obvious that A on n is just A sub n, n. Because um, for any value n not, not equal to one of the dummy index, so then you get zero. In other words, if I had chosen to be k here. Then the reason for this would be that this would equal some n a sub n n k but this is delta n k, so this is just equal to a k k. Okay. So this is a very useful way of looking at emission operators and emission matrices. It's especially important in quantum mechanics. And in fact, um, you can think of this as um, As these, well, let's put it this way. You can think of these these outer products of these eigenvectors as representing mathematically an apparatus that would allow the state n through 
and stop all the others. So, for example, the Stern-Gerlach experiment might have um, a magnet looking like this. So, north pole, south pole, say. And the magnetic field here is very inhomogeneous. It's stronger near the point, weaker here. And you send a beam of atoms through, and uh, they'll go, some will go, they'll go up or down, I get the sign on. Anyway, they go up or down according to the, the interaction of the spin with the magnetic field. And, um, and, and that way you could um, separate the beam into several beams and stop all but one, the one going through with the uh, particular outer product. Showing a little paper on this. Anyway, it's a very important way to think about it, um, about the mission operator. Now, a mission operator, of course, is diagonal in the basis provided by a this n orthonormal eigenvector. And that's because a m n, which would be m a n, well, a on n is just a sub n, this would be m n, and so this would be a n delta m n. So it's diagonal. On the other hand, any other basis, uh, the matrix is in general not diagonal. And for example, in a basis, say, KO, I guess O means other here, you have DIK is IOAKO, and this is then IO sum on um, N, N A sub N, N KO, and um, so we can think of we can we can extract from that a linear operator U, which is the sum say K equals one to N of the outer product of K with K O, and in other words the outer product of the K that is the k eigenvector of A with the k basis vector of this other basis. And this U is uh, unitary because it maps normal normal basis, these guys, into another often normal basis, these guys. And any linear operator that maps one often normal basis into another of the same dimension is unitary. Any questions? In this um, other basis, uh, U is a matrix whose nth column, in other words, UIN, would be I0, U, N0. But on the other hand, U takes N0. You see, this is sum K k0, n0, and of course I'm assuming that n0, k0 is delta n k, I should say this is an also normal basis. And so this will be just simply state n. So u takes the, or the other basis into the basis of eigenvectors of a. And so this is i l n. So the nth column of the of this this here it looks like a unit it's, it's a unitary operator over here it's in this space it's represented by this matrix and the nth column uh, has entries like that and so this uh, equation where is it over here a 
AIK equals this, well, that is saying that AIK is equal to, you see, this is I0N, so that's UIN summed over N from 1 to big N, A sub N, and then NK0, and NK0 is U dagger NK. That is to say, U dagger NK is U KN complex conjugate, and U KN is K0 N complex conjugate, and so that's N K0, and that's in fact what we have here. Okay? All right, so this equation here can be written in matrix notation as A is equal to U A diagonal U adjoint, and in fact, in terms of the matrices that represent these linear operators, then it is, this is the matrix, that matrix, this is the matrix A, and AD has entries NM is AN plus NM. Okay, is that, any questions about that? Anyway, these are the sort of tricks that one uses all the time on the campus. Now, we've been talking about matrices that are Hermitian. Hermitian means that the complex conjugate of the transpose is the matrix itself. There are two special and important examples of Hermitian matrices. For example, a matrix that is real and symmetric. Well, if it's real and symmetric, then A dagger IK is AKI complex conjugate, but this is AK, if it's symmetric, AKI is AIK, and if it's real, AIK is AIK, AIK star is AIK. So, in other words, if the thing is symmetric and real, then it's Hermitian. So, a real and symmetric matrix implies that it's Hermitian. What does symmetric mean again? Symmetric means that it's equal to its transpose. Okay. Good question. And equal to its transpose means that it's equal to its AKI, and real, of course, is AIK star. So, this is one class of Hermitian matrices, real symmetric matrices. Another important class of Hermitian matrices is matrices that are imaginary and anti-symmetric. So, if the matrix is imaginary and anti-symmetric, so, in other words, imaginary means AIK star is minus AIK, and anti-symmetric means AKI is minus AIK. Well, if it's 
imaginary and anti-symmetric, then it's automatically Hermitian because A dagger I K is equal to A star K I and A K I is minus A I K. Then it's imaginary, so the minus sign cancels and you get the A I K again. So these are two famous classes of matrices. In other words, if you have a Hermitian matrix, and let me put it this way. If you need a set of matrices that's Hermitian, your life will be simpler if you make them either real and symmetric or imaginary and anti-symmetric or some of the one and some of the other. Of course, the general Hermitian matrix is not real or symmetric or imaginary or anti-symmetric. But if you have, if you're at liberty to choose your Hermitian matrices, then it's a good idea to choose them from these two classes. And that's exactly what Wolfgang Pauli did about 90 years ago when he defined the Pauli matrix in sigma 1 is 0, 1, 1, 0. So this is real and symmetric. Sigma 2 is 0, minus I, I, 0. This is imaginary and anti-symmetric. And then the last one is sigma 3, which is just 1, 0, 0, minus 1. It's real and symmetric and in fact diagonal. And these are used to represent the spin of the electron or quark or neutrino or whatever. I might say that just parenthetically that as far as, I would just say that we do not understand what spin really is. We just know how to play with it as in terms of Pauli matrices. But what it is apart from angular momentum, why the electron is in one hand, et cetera, that's one of the mysteries. Okay. So suppose now we have a matrix that, let us say, is real and symmetric. So that's a special case. Well, it turns out that because it's real and symmetric, you can diagonalize it. You don't need a unitary transformation. You can diagonalize it by a real unitary matrix. In that case, the matrix is orthogonal. So for this case, you can say A is equal to O, A diagonal, O transpose. An orthogonal matrix is real. Well, you can keep these things together. O star equals O, and O transpose is O inverse. And all right. I don't have this case worked out in my notes. I'll have to think about it. Anyway, let's skip that issue right now. All right. I have an example here, which is actually a very physical example. As you know, the masses of the so-called elementary particles are wildly different. The top quark is a mass of something like 180 jet or so. MC squared is 180 GeV, where GeV is a billion electron volts, giga electron volts. The neutrinos have masses that are fractions of an electron volt, as far as we know. I add that because the neutrino experiments tell us the differences of the squares of the masses of neutrinos. And so you don't know what the actual masses are. You just know what the differences of the squared masses are. But they seem to be all less than an electron volt. Anyway, the question is, why 
should those passages be so light? And um, one uh, mechanism is to think about a two by two matrix of this form. Here we're imagining that, first of all, this is real and symmetric, so it's division. Secondly, we're imagining that this is sort of a garden variety mass. So suppose it's like, uh, so that mc squared is like 10 MeV. And then the question is, what are the eigenvalues of this mass matrix? And well, right, let's, let's figure that out. That comes from this equation the determinant of m minus mu times the identity equals zero. And that is um, mu times mu minus m uh, minus m squared equals to zero. And you use the quadratic formula there and you find mu plus or minus is a half big M plus or minus square root of big M squared plus four little m squared. So we're imagining then that M is huge. And so the big mass is M plus M. And we can sort of ignore that. The big mass and mu plus is approximately M plus M squared over M. That is to say, you pull out the M, you write this as one half M plus or minus big M times Square root of 1 plus 4m squared over big M squared. Then you expand this and you get um, expanding to the case. So, so you get 1 half um, m plus or minus m times 1 plus 2m squared over big M squared. And so the plus case gives you 2m plus 2 this, and divided by 2, you get that. The minus case is where the m's cancel, and you get minus, minus m squared over big M. Big M. Now you might worry, oh, the mass is negative, it's a tachyon or something. Well, no. The, in, in, the mass parameter for a spin one half particle can be positive or negative, and the mass is uh, the absolute value of the mass parameter. So there's no problem there. And in fact, it's imaginary mass. Um, so we can now look at this um, from the point of view of, um, of uh, the Neutrino experiments, assuming that that we can infer the masses from the mass squared relations, which we really can, but not the power to do it anyway. So we say mc squared is 10 mv. Um, we want mu minus c squared to be something like 0.01 dv, which is sort of a plausible light neutrino mass. So then what does m have to be? Well, it's 0.01 dv is equal then to uh, 100 and 10 mv squared divided by big M. So big M is 100 mv squared divided by 0.01 dv and um, so that gives us, um, here we have 10 to the fourth, and then we have um, uh, an MeV over an EV is 10 to the sixth, and then we have um, an, uh, an MeV. And so I'm getting 10 to the tenth, MeV, which is then 10 to the 7th GeV. 
mass of a proton being mc squared of a proton being about a GeV. So this is 10 million times the mass of a proton. And um, that's something that is uh, three orders of magnitude beyond the energy that we achieved at the LHC. Assuming the thing works and the thing is full. Um, so in other words, the, the, the idea of this um, thanks. The idea of this um, of this model, which actually was invented by two people in this department, um, Murray Delmont when he was actually at Caltech, and um, George Stevenson when he was at Los Alamos, um, came up with this seesaw model. Um, so it, in other words, if the seesaw model is the reason why it, it explains the light neutrino masses, then that tells us that there's an energy scale where something's going on at 10 to the 7 GeV, three orders of magnitude beyond the energies of uh, the, the explored in Geneva at the LHC. And um, whether this is the correct explanation, I should know. Another possible explanation is that the lightness of neutrino masses is because the neutrinos only interact through the W and the Z gate bosons, which are very, very heavy, and so the interactions are very weak. So what is the term of the matrix supposed to represent that? I mean, how do they put that together, I guess? This is assuming what, when, when they built this, mass, this is like a mass matrix. The, the it's one you started with. Um, the, the yeah, this is a mass matrix, and um, so in other words, well, an ordinary mass matrix, and in, in an ordinary theory of spin one half particles, you have um, simply an M uh, times psi bar psi. You know, there's an M like that. This occurs in the Lagrangian or the Hamiltonian or the action. And you infer that the particle has mass M, where this is actually plus or minus M. But in, um, and, and you might have a couple of these. You might have a sum over I, N I, where this is the field representing the species I. Now, um, the point is that the fields that occur in the, in the action of the run of the Hamiltonian start out as not being eigenstates of mass. And so what you would have is you have something like psi bar, this matrix M psi. Okay. And in this two by two case, then it would be the sum on IJ plus one to two, I, IJ, J. And then you diagonalize this, and this would give you the mass associated, mass associated with the physical masses in the problem. Am, am I right to say that you wouldn't worry about this in classical, I mean in non-relativistic quantum mechanics? That wouldn't pop up, or am I wrong to think that? Um, who can tell? I mean, I'm not sure the books on non-relativistic quantum mechanics, some books on non-relativistic quantum mechanics would put in the C small mechanism. Might, I don't know. I'm just asking, is that, because I'm not familiar with like, the plus and minus mass, or, or the mass matrix? Oh, that, yeah. This, the fact that it doesn't matter whether it's plus or minus, mm -hmm. is just um, a property of uh, the Dirac equation. Right. So it is, OK. All right, now let's get back to this um, this orthogonal transformation over here. So suppose we have a real Hermitian matrix. And as I said, we can write it as um, O, the diagonal form O transpose. But then what you can do is you can take and Sort of renormalize this. You can you can multiply the 
elf column of this by the square root of the elf entry on this diagonal matrix. And you also multiply the elf row, row L, I should say, here by the same factor, square root of that. When you do that, you can then write R as some C, R hat diagonal, C transpose, where this is a diagonal matrix where all the entries on the diagonal plus or minus one. And what I should have said was absolute value. Right, it's in the notes. And this is something that actually is used in general relativity when you, for example, in the four by four case, you might have some matrix G, diagonal matrix GD. Well, let me do it twice. You write G as O, G, D, O transpose, and that would give you O transpose G, O would be G, D. Okay, but you could arrange for these things, for G, D to have plus or minus ones on the diagonal by doing this trick of multiplying the L column, the L row by the square root of the modulus of the L eigenvector, eigenvalue, and this would give you some G hat D, and this would then be plus or minus one, plus or minus two, minus zero, whatever else. This thing is called Sylvester's theorem. Anyway, a particular case of this is that you can take the metric of space time and write it as C transpose G, C, and then it can be, it would be minus one, 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 zero goes away. So at a particular point in space time, you can find matrices that not only make diagonal, but make the entries plus or minus one, and because the metric has a minus sign in the time, the time components, one is for space and one is for minus, it looks like that. In general, in general relativity, you can only do this at one point. On the other hand, in special relativity, where space time is flat, you can do this everywhere, and so this is a metric of flat space special relativity. All right, so that's sort of an aside. Any questions? All right, the next topic is normal matrices. Normal matrices are the largest class that can be diagonalized by unitary matrices. A normal matrix is a matrix that commutes with its adjoint. So A, A dagger, minus A dagger A, equals zero. Now, obviously, if the matrix is Hermitian, then this is just A squared minus A squared equals zero. So all Hermitian matrices are normal. Also, if A happens to be unitary, then A, A dagger is equal to A dagger A, because both are equal to the identity. So this is just equal to the identity minus the identity, which is equal to zero. So all unitary matrices are normal. Normal matrices are matrices that commute with their adjoints. So these are nice matrices. And as I said, they include the unitary 
and the emission matrices. So most of the matrices that are used in quantum mechanics are, let's say the ones that are used most in quantum mechanics are normal matrices. They're either emission or unity. All right, now what we want to see now is why a normal matrix can be diagonalized by a unitary transformation. So I'm going to call the normal matrix V. So we have V dagger equals zero. It's an N by N matrix. And since it's square, we know that it has it has N eigenvectors with eigenvalues V sub N. Now, on the other hand, since it's normal, we can do this. We can write V minus V N I dagger V minus V N I N. And this is going to be zero because V minus V N I on N is zero. So this thing is zero. Yeah. So going from V minus V N I times N equals zero to your next step, all you're saying is because they're normal, you're taking the inner product of them, and that equals zero as well. We've got the logic a little bit convoluted. Because the thing is square, it has these N eigenvectors with eigenvalues, and we don't know anything more about those eigenvalues and eigenvectors than that they exist. So I say pick one of them, and then form the inner product of that eigenvector with its adjoint. So this thing. So this. And that's zero simply because V minus V N I on this N is zero. So this is the zero state into no matter what this is, you get zero. So you can do anything else. Yeah, yeah. So that is this part of zero. Okay, but now because they're normal, you can interchange these two. The identity commutes with everything. And so you get that zero is equal also to N V minus V N I V minus V N I dagger N. Okay, on the other hand, this is just the norm square of the state V minus V N I V N dagger V N I star set on N squared. But it's zero. So that means that the norm of the state is zero. That means that V dagger minus V N star I times N is equal to zero because it's a vector that has length zero. Of course, we're relying here on this inner product being a permission of a non-singular. In other words, if the inner product of the state with itself is zero, then the state has to be the zero state. Okay. So in other words, V dagger N is equal to V N star N. So normal matrices have this funny property that if N is an eigenvector of V with eigenvalue V N, it's also an eigenvector of V N star with eigenvalue V N dagger with eigenvalue V N star. Now suppose V N is V N N V M is V M M then what do we have? Then M N M V N is equal to V N and the inner product of M with N on the 
the other hand, the adjoint of this equation is m v dagger is equal to v m star m. And oh, all right, hold it now. But it's also true that, let's see, did I switch these things around? Okay, we have this equation. But you see, this also implies that v dagger on m is v m star m. So forget about that I wrote this down. It's a true equation, but we don't need it. We take the adjoint of this equation, and we get m v is equal to v m m. And now we take the inner part of this equation with the ket n, and we get m v n equals v m m n. And so now we compare these two equations. And in fact, we subtract them, and we get v n minus v m times m n equals zero. So this tells us then that the eigenvectors, the normal matrix, are orthogonal if the eigenvalues are different. So m n equals zero if v n is not equal to v m, because if they're not equal, this is not zero. We divide through by it, and we get that this is equal to zero. So the eigenvectors of eigenvectors associated with eigenvalues that are different for a normal matrix are orthogonal. Of course, we saw that previously for an emission matrix, and now we get it for a class of all unitary matrices and also all normal matrices. It might not be unitary or emission. Now, usually, the eigenvalues of a normal matrix are going to be all different. It's n by n. You get n different complex numbers. In general, they're complex. Sometimes, though, if there's a symmetry, then you'll have a degeneracy. And if there's a degeneracy, then what you can do is you can basically add to v epsilon times some crooked matrix that breaks the degeneracy, and then you have all the eigenvectors of that crooked matrix are orthonormal. You then take the limit epsilon going to zero, and you have an orthonormal set. And, of course, if you're doing an actual physical problem, you want to pick a crooked matrix that has some physical relevance. And then that argument that I went through there on those boards over there to show that a permission matrix could be diagonalized by a unitary transformation, well, that also works. You can extend that to the case of a normal matrix, and then you get u, v, v, u diagonalized to u. So any normal matrix can be diagonalized by a unitary transformation. And as before, the nth column of this matrix u is just the end product of the basis vectors of the ordinary basis with the eigenvectors of the matrix v. Let's just go through that same spiel that I went through there and repeat it to you. All right, any questions? Let me take a sip of tea here.
All right, let's now go back to the concept of permanent, and let's look for... By the way, if you run out of track, just tell me. I'm going to take a look at the statute. So let's think about the determinant of a normal matrix as a particularly simple form. So we want... Remember, absolute value of a matrix is another way of writing determinant. So the determinant of a matrix, well, V can be written in diagonal form, so it's the determinant of VD to be diagonal. But you remember the product of determinants, the determinant of a product of matrices is the product of the determinants of the matrices. So this is equal to determinant U, determinant VD, determinant U diagonal. On the other hand, we showed back in equation 210 that the determinant of a... of a unitary matrix was unimodular. That is to say, it's a phase factor. The number is absolute value of 1. Another way of thinking of that is just to take U, U diagonal, and just use this product of determinant rule again to say that this is the determinant of U, U diagonal. So U, U diagonal is 1, so it's the determinant of 1, and that's just the number 1. Consequently, the determinant of V is the determinant of its diagonal form, and that's just the product, I equals 1 to big N, of the ith eigenvalue. So the determinant of a normal matrix is the product of its eigenvalues. And in particular, the determinant of a Hermitian matrix is the product of its real eigenvalues. The determinant of a unitary matrix is the product of its unimodular eigenvalues. And so the determinant of, say, A, let's say Hermitian, is then the product of the A sub Ns, N equals 1 to big N. These are all real. The determinant of some unitary matrix is the product of its eigenvalues, and those are all phase factors. And so this is just some phase factor, E to the i theta. Oh, okay. Now, I'm not going to prove the next three relations, but I may eventually make them into homework problems. If V is a normal matrix, then its determinant can be written as the exponential of the trace of the natural log of V. And the natural log of the determinant is the trace of the natural log of V. And the change in the natural log of V is the trace of V inverse the change in V. So I'm just going to leave them there. I'm not going to call them here. Okay. Any questions? By the way, Gail Martin is an extremely interesting man. And he was talking in his class. He gives a class on complexity. It's on Tuesdays and Thursdays, 1230 to 4 to 2. And I'm not particularly interested in complexity. But Gail Martin has met all the major physicists, or at least theoretical physicists, of the 21st century. And he has just remarkable stories about them and about all sorts of other things. Anyway, he once asked Dirac, how come 
the papers that he was writing were all about Bohr's theory of the atom, which was a big advance over no quantum mechanics, but it wasn't, you know, it was just, it just worked for the hydrogen atom and it was well short, it was just rules of quantization, you know, the Bohr quantization, the angular momentum effectively is an inch long. Anyhow, and then at a certain point, all of a sudden, Dirac was writing papers about using all modern quantum mechanics, and so Gelman asked Dirac, how come you switched to this other property? And Gelman said, I read the Heisenberg paper. Okay, so we'll leave this slide there. All right, the next topic, tricks with Dirac notation. So we've seen that if we have eigenstates of a matrix that are complete and lawful normal, as is true for normal matrices, then the identity operator can be written as NN summed over N equals 1 to the N, if it's an N by N matrix, and you can therefore write A, this is what I did for Hermitian matrices earlier, and so this is A on that, and that's then just the sum of N, A sub N, N, N equals 1 to the N. So you can, any matrix that has N of the normal eigenvectors with eigenvalues AN can be written in this form. It follows then that F of A is just how shall I say, well, one way of thinking about it is F of A on N is just F of AN on N, and so F of A is just the sum N, F of AN, N, N equals 1 to the N. So this is a sort of a more general, I mean, this is a simpler expression than the one I gave before, and this works for any, this really works for any square, so this is for any square non-defective matrix. Remember, non-defective means it has a complete set of eigenvectors. Okay, now, use is made of this all the time in quantum mechanics. So as an example, consider the Hamiltonian, what did I use, EN, so these are, the Hamiltonian then is a Hermitian matrix, more generally it's a Hermitian operator, but we can think of an operator as a Hermitian by Hermitian matrix. So H on N is some energy EN, and this is real, and now the time evolution operator is E to the minus HT over H bar, and that's a pretty complicated object, but on the other hand, you can write that as simply a sum N, E to the minus I ENT over H bar N, where N goes from 1 to big N, and so this is what one does all the time in quantum mechanics, and in particular, that's why we really want to know the energy eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, the eigenvectors of the energy operator, and the reason is that gives us the time evolution, that gives us a nice formula for the unitary time evolution operator, and in particular, E to the minus I HT over H bar on some arbitrary state psi is the sum N equals 1 to big N, and E to the minus I ENT over H bar 
on the inner part of the thyroid end. So you can split the states, the cat side, into, um, into its components and in the direction end. And each of those components then runs in time with a different frequency. And in fact, typically one writes omega as en over h bar. And so this is the sum n equals 1 big n n minus i omega n t n psi. So this is, this is an application of this direct notation. Okay. Um, <coughs> all right, so now I'm sort of out of board again. Um, but the next topic is another topic that's important in quantum mechanics, namely matrices that are compatible or matrices that commute with each other. And in quantum mechanics, the, important, the most important case is for permission matrices that commute with each other. Of course, if you take a permission matrix and multiply it by an imaginary number and exponentiate it, then uh, you have a unitary matrix. And if you do that with two permission matrices that commute with each other, you then get two unitary matrices that commute with each other. All right. So, so let me use this board to define some of this. So, so I'm going to be thinking now of two normal matrices. A and B, such that the kind of advantage will be considered to be compatible. Or commuting. So they commute with each other. And um, any normal matrix A can be written as a sum of the eigenvectors, the eigenvalues, eigenvectors out of the product. So that's what A is. You'll notice I left out the eigenvalues. Right. And I put the homework assignment up over the weekend, I guess. Um, so it's through the next nine problems at the end of chapter one. And uh, do them by two weeks from today. Anyway, whatever it says on the web. You guys know where the web page is, right? All right, let me um, erase this. Two eigenstates of A 
And I'm writing them as AN. Just um, because if I just label them by an index, an integer index, then uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't know that they refer to the that they were like that to the A rather than a B. Well, this is equal to A N A B minus B A A K. A on A K is well let me write this. Minus B that would be A K A K. And now the adjoint of this equation is a n a n star um hold on a second. Well these are normal matrix. So the point is that we showed for a normal matrix that this relation there also means that A dagger on N is A N star N. Remember, for a normal matrix, that's true. We take the adjoint of that, we get N A is equal to A N N. So this is a n a sub n b, and so this is equal to a n minus a k a n b a k. All right. So because the matrices commute, this expression must be zero. And because I've assumed that A, the eigenvalues of A are non-degenerate, these guys will all be non-zero. We can buy through by them, and we get A N B A K is A N B A N delta N K. In other words, B is diagonal. B is diagonal. in the eigenstates, the evex of A. So we have two normal matrices, we have two normal matrices that commute with each other. The eigenvalues of one are non-degenerate. Then in the basis provided by the eigenvectors of the first one, of A, the operator B is diagonal. The matrix B is diagonal. Okay? Alright. Um, so now we can write B. In a nice way, we can say B is the identity operator B times the identity operator, and the identity operator can be written as just the outer part of the eigenstates of A. So this is sum A n A n n equals one to B n B. Sum k equals one to n a k a k. Okay. But the eigen, the matrix elements of B are diagonal, and so this means that this is non-zero only if n is equal to k, and so this is the sum n equals one to big N. A sub n, A sub n B, A sub n, um, A sub n. 
So B is of this form. And in fact, that means with B on an eigenvector of A is equal to first A sub n B A sub n times A sub n. Because if we multiply, use this expression and have B act on A sub, let me, let me use it as A k. Then we have the sum on n from 1 to big N. A sub n, A sub n, B, A sub n, A sub n, A sub k. But this is equal to delta n k. Because the eigenvectors of A are orthogonal. And so that gives us, um, if I use a k here, or, or let me just continue this. In other words, that's delta n k, so that just gives us a k times a k b a k. Or replacing n by k, k by n, we get that. So in other words, the, eigen, uh, the eigenvectors of A are also eigenvectors of B. So we started with was two normal matrices. One of them is non-degenerate, non-degenerate eigenvalues. Then the eigenvectors of the first matrix are also eigenvectors of the second matrix. And so that happens all the time in quantum mechanics. An example is um, the Hamiltonian and the angular momentum and the Z component of the angular momentum, per se, the hydrogen atom. Then um, all three of those operators commute with each other. And in fact, no, actually, I'm, I'm, I said something wrong. It's H L squared and say LZ. Are the triplet, there we just had two, but here we have three commission operators that commute with each other. Consequently, one can find eigenvectors that are eigenvectors of all three operators simultaneously. One does that all the time in quantum mechanics and comes from this particular theorem. So two compatible normal matrices can be simultaneously diagonalized if one of them has non-degenerate eigenvalues. Okay. Now the question is, what if um, the eigenvectors, the eigenvalues of A, say, are in fact degenerate? Well, in that case, go over here. Now what we've got is that um, we have A on A sub n, K is A sub n, A sub n, K, and K one up to D sub n. So we have D sub n degenerate eigenvalues. Um, and Um, so using that trick with the crooked matrix uh, business, we can arrange that these guys are all orthogonal. A n k, A n k prime is delta k, k prime. Okay, then what you can show is that A n k b A m a prime is zero for a n not equal to a m, but in general, a n k b a n k prime. Well, this will be a square matrix. With 
and all the elements of that square matrix could be non-zero. So this, so B isn't diagonal. On the other hand, this is a, because B is a normal operator, um, the matrix that represents it in any basis will be a normal matrix. And so, what one can do, in fact, let me, let me pause here a second to say that if we looked at this operator B, or this matrix B, in this basis, look at the operator B in the, mace, in the basis provided by these orthonormal eigenvectors of the normal matrix A, then B would look like this. It might be uh, E1, E2, but then you'd have one that was degenerate, and we'd have um, B, B prime, B double prime, B triple prime. And then there might be one that's oh, what we call B1, B2, B3, B2 prime, B1 prime, B2 prime, B3 prime, B2 prime, B3 prime, B prime, B double prime, one, B double prime, B2 prime, B double prime, B. In other words, the matrix B would would consist of square matrices on its main diagonal. And these matrices, if there are, if here, here are the case is that D is equal to three, here D equal to two. In other words, if, the, if you have an eigenvalue that's doubly degenerate, it'd be a two by two, triply degenerate, three by three, and so forth. This is called a block diagonal matrix. So a block diagonal matrix is a matrix that's as close to diagonal as you can get. It has, it has just has, it's got zeros except for the main diagonal. And on this main diagonal, some of these matrices are 2 by 2, 3 by 3, 4 by 4, or whatever. All right. I, I, I'll, I'll pick this up next time because we we're almost through. The, the upshot though is that if you have two matrices that commute, you can find complete orthonormal eigenvectors uh, such that both of them can be simultaneously diagonalized, whether or not you have a problem with the others. Okay, somebody have a pencil so I can mark this place. I'll hang around and answer and questions. Let me click this thing.